So scientific projects. What kind of projects are compatible with the GEP? <clears throat> Overall, we've found that teaching eukaryotic gene annotation uh, works pretty well for us because it fits into a lot of curricula. Uh, it covers some of the <clears throat> knowledge goals that, that people have. And at the same time, uh, it provides opportunities for investigation. Uh, we're looking at a variety of organisms over uh, different evolutionary times. Uh, unexpected things happen all the time, which is really cool. Uh, and um, in general, it's been a useful vehicle for combining <clears throat> our teaching and our research. So we're looking for projects that benefit from hundreds of annotations of coding and non-coding regions, including newly sequenced genomes. Remember this basic principle of doing a cure. We need something where we can have parallel projects, where we can teach a given strategy and the students can uh, do individual uh, projects and contributions. And there are an awful lot of questions that you can ask about genes and genomes that uh, fit this paradigm, so we're not worried about running out of raw material. Okay? Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, what is publicly available does have its limits, uh, and in particular, uh, we have felt that the biggest barrier for us to explore new problems, new genomes, is the creation of the genome browser. Uh, this is something that takes some doing, takes some uh, uh, IT skill, uh, and we have therefore worked with Galaxy to create a workflow that makes it easier to do this. Uh, and there is a published paper now describing that workflow. Uh, there's a website up on how to use it. If you or a colleague have uh, a newly sequenced genome uh, that you think would make a good GEP uh, project, uh, here's the way to get the browser and get things started. <clears throat> and um, Wilson supports both the GEP and GeonRAM. Uh, so you know it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what scientific projects have we actually been doing? Um, All right. <clears throat> what we've been doing uh, the past several years is looking at the organization and functioning of the dot chromosome in Drosophila. Uh, it's of interest because it's a heterochromatic domain that has 80 uh, indigenous genes. We want to know both how silencing is maintained, but also how uh, appropriate transcription is accomplished. And our first paper was a uh, comparison over 40 million years, uh, just to, and I should show you, and we'll show you again a few slides from that, looking at uh, the properties of the genes and the chromosome over that evolutionary time. Our emphasis right now is on the phylogenomic footprinting project in which we're looking to try to identify regulatory motifs or patterns uh, that enable expression of genes on the fourth chromosome in that heterochromatic milieu. We're really um, pretty much winding up this project in terms of the accumulation of the annotation data. And the next uh, project on the F element will be this uh, question of looking at a subset of four species in which there has been an expansion of the F. The genome uh, size for the, uh, that species of fly has stayed approximately the same, <clears throat> but uh, the region encoding the, the genes <clears throat> on the F element has expanded from 1.4 megabases to 20 megabases. <clears throat> we think primarily by the invasion of uh, retrotransposons. And what are the consequences for the chromosome and the genes? I think it's a very interesting question because I think it can serve as the paradigm for expansion of eukaryotic genomes in general, which, as you know, is impressive. Our genome is three times 10 to the ninth base pairs. Flies are only two times 10 to the eighth, so forth, so on. <clears throat> okay, so that's coming up. <clears throat> the other two projects, and, and we just have a couple of slides today on these two projects, but as uh, Catherine said, you'll hear more about them Sunday morning if you're able to stay for that. Uh, is a project in the parasitoid wasps 
uh, to understand genomic basis of the loss of lipid biosynthesis, uh, loss of genes, pseudogenization, and so forth, and then the evolution of the venom proteins. Uh, so this parasitoid wasp has a, a love-hate relationship with Drosophila. Uh, this is common out in uh, you know, nature, uh, wild and, and raw, uh, that there's a delicate balance between what's a parasite and what's a symbiote. Uh, and a lot of back and forth on those kinds of issues. <clears throat> and the WASP project uh, begins to address those at a molecular level. So this requires finding the same genes in uh, several different species of WASP and looking at them. And then, uh, again, uh, that sort of strategy is also used in uh, this project, evolution of the insulin signaling pathway in Drosophila. So here, rather than looking at a genomic domain, we're looking at a cluster of genes. Uh, and identifying those genes and then trying to find them in the uh, different species uh, that are available to us. <clears throat> These get a little more challenging because they're covering greater evolutionary uh, distances. Uh, and I should say also from a, uh, a pedagogical point of view, you don't have to limit yourself. You may want to start with um, some of the simpler Drosophila projects in your introductory class and then challenge some of those students to take on uh, projects that are more challenging uh, in an upper level class, and this sort of thing. There's all kinds of mix and match possibilities. <clears throat> okay, are there questions on that? And then I'm gonna go on and talk uh, in greater detail about the Drosophila case. <coughs> okay, so, um, Marisol, uh, Martin, have either of you done a WASP or Pathway project yet? <clears throat> okay. So Sunday morning there'll be an opportunity to hear about those projects and then to go into the computer lab and see uh, some of the uh, approaches and tools that are uh, you would use that are unique to those projects. But they're based on the same um, same starting point, annotating genes. Okay. So my interest in the fourth chromosome goes back to this uh, question of how DNA is packaged in the nucleus. Uh, remember, if you're a human, uh, you've got two meters of DNA packaged into every nucleus, to every diploid nucleus. So the amount of packaging is stunning. <clears throat> and it has to be done correctly so that uh, the majority of the genome is silence, but the genes that are needed are available for gene expression. We know quite a lot about <clears throat> the structure of DNA. We know quite a lot about the structure of the nucleosome at this point. Uh, we have some pretty good ideas uh, about how that chromatin fiber is coiled again, although I actually think this picture's wrong. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, the <coughs> DNA in a given chromosome is one molecule from telomere to centromere to telomere, uh, but that it's subdivided into topological and structural domains which are approximated by that sketch. <clears throat> and then we know that further condensation must occur. The artist made up something to uh, fit uh, the critique of whoever the author was. Uh, and then you end up with a metaphase chromosome, which is recognizable as such. So I always do try to impress on the students there's a gradient here of our confidence in our model, because this kind of figure shows up in all kinds of textbooks. And you want your students to know uh, that this is well-founded and this is hand-waving. Uh, and there's kind of gradient from one to the next. Wait, which one is hand-waving? Pardon? Which one is hand-waving? This one. Just that one? Oh, well, only that one? Well, this one is an artist's attempt to <clears throat> uh, describe what we know, and that is that this long fragment of DNA that makes up a single chromosome is subdivided into topological domains, structural domains. And we've got quite a lot of evidence that that happens, <clears throat> both as a basis of um, chromatin packaging, uh, underlying it, anchoring um, different domains topologically. By topology, I mean <clears throat> the fact that the DNA is wound. You guys all know about topo 1, topo 2, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we have good evidence that that happens, all right? Um, we've had a hard time establishing what those boundaries are, how constant they are, and to what degree they're cell type specific. So that gets very fuzzy. 
uh, but the concept is okay, that there are subdivision, uh, subdivisions in the chromatin fiber. Um, but like I said, I think this is just hand-waving, uh, and I think it's wrong. Um, okay. I can expound on these sorts of things for a great length, which you don't want me to do, you don't want me to do during lunch. Okay. The question that I'm most interested in is, is really summed up by this picture, and that is that uh, the chromatin uh, fiber, as it's present in the nucleus, uh, on the very first level shows a subdivision into what we call heterochromatin and euchromatin. And this goes right back to <coughs> psychology uh, in the earlier 1900s where people observed that if they stained uh, the nucleus with a dye, and we now know <coughs> that the critical dyes are those that will bind to DNA, <coughs> uh, they would find that they didn't have an even distribution across the nucleus. And this is true whether you're looking in the light microscope or the electron microscope that you will see clumps of uh, more highly stained material implying a more condensed configuration, more DNA per unit <coughs> uh, here. And these clumps tend to be around the periphery and around the nucleolus. <coughs> and the name comes just from the cytological observation that that is heterochromatin, <coughs> and that uh, the more diffuse area is the euchromatin. <coughs> and then over time, um, we found that we could uh, associate uh, these different distributions with a whole suite of characteristics in that the heterochromatin seemed to be associated with centromeres and telomeres. Uh, it tends to be late replicating. Uh, there is no meiotic recombination in heterochromatin. It's part of the accepted definition at this point. Now, over the last 20 years, we've been able to move our observations from <coughs> cytology and cell biology into biochemistry. And that, of course, has come with the identification of the nucleosome as the unit of packaging uh, for that first chromatin fiber. So my premise here is that all of the genome is packaged up in nucleosomes, pretty much. Uh, but then there are differential impacts uh, that result in uh, a different packaging of the next level. Uh, at a bare minimum, discriminating between chromatin and euchromatin. Okay, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, the uh, we took out my favorite slides of the EM. I uh, showed uh, our first inkling of chromatin as a repeating structure, uh, uh, the so-called beads on a string. Um, you've probably all seen those pictures. Uh, when those pictures were first published, some people were wildly enthusiastic and others were very skeptical. <clears throat> but ultimately, we were able to isolate the subunit and crystallize it. Uh, it took quite a few years from the first observations to the crystal structure. Um, I'm trying to remember how many years. 70s. From the 70s, 73, 73 for those first EMs, 97 for the crystal, 1997 for the crystal structure. <clears throat> Why was it so difficult? Well, to get well-defined crystals, you have to have particles that look exactly the same. And so in the end, this was done by uh, synthesizing the histones in E. coli to avoid the post-translational modifications that differentiate uh, one type of chromatin from another. Uh, and again, a synthetic DNA so that it was exactly symmetrical, but very nice crystals. And what I want to point out is the uh, non-covalent interactions between the histone core and the DNA. And that's indicated by these little white hooks. And you'll notice uh, that they are extensive and they involve both strands of the DNA. So it sounds somewhat contradictory, but once DNA is packaged up in a nucleosome, it is invisible to RNA polymerase or Tata binding protein or anything else. It is so bent, and, I, and it sounds contradictory because it's on the outside, but it is so bent uh, that it cannot, and so anchored, that it cannot be opened up, cannot be used. Most uh, DNA binding proteins do not recognize their sequence when it's in a nucleosome. There are exceptions, and they're important exceptions. But for the most part, this kind of packaging <coughs> removes the DNA from place, so to speak, in the nucleus. Okay, now this is the core structure uh, and involves 
uh, the C-terminal two-thirds of each of the histone uh, proteins. But the histones also have N-terminal tails that stick out here and are highly unstructured. Uh, and so this is, of course, a made-up picture because the crystallographer can't see anything that's unstructured. Uh, but we know uh, the relative length of these uh, tails. These are the N-terminal amino acid tails. And we know that they are extensively modified, uh, post-translational modifications. Showing this to undergraduates, I usually start with phosphorylation. That's what they're most familiar with. They know that you can uh, covalently uh, link this to a serine or a threonine, and you can remove it. And that comes up you know, a lot of times in cell biology and biochemistry. So they're used to that. But you can also do acetylation or methylation. You can even do ubiquitinylation. Uh, and this involves linking a peptide to the protein. And all of these are post-translational modifications that occur with great specificity. Uh, within the cell, you're going to find enzymes <coughs> that will methylate H3 at lysine 9, specifically. And that's the only site uh, that they will methylate. Or they will acetylate it. Uh, or they will deacetylate it. All of these modifications have enzymes that put on the modification and enzymes that take, take off the modification. So it's a very flexible system for tagging uh, the histones. It will convey different properties. Notice, for example, that the histone for a tail has lysine at 5, 8, 12, 16, 20. That's a pretty basic tail, right? And it can fit in the major groove of the DNA and have a, a very strong interaction. But if you acetylate each of those lysines, you remove the charge that change is going to uh, change the property, the interaction of the histone core with the DNA and will facilitate transcription. But more important than that, each of these modifications can be considered uh, a flag, a tag, a recognizable signal. And the enzymes that put them on are called riders, and the proteins that respond to their presence uh, are called readers. And a reader-writer system enables you to uh, modify the histone in known ways and to maintain that modification or to remove it in response to appropriate signals. So now our picture of heterochromatin and euchromatin is getting more sophisticated uh, in that not only can we lay out these properties, which I previously mentioned, but we can also begin to model a different structure. Uh, one where uh, in the euchromatin you have the, uh, either the presence or the potential for the hyperacetylated state, acetylated tails. Uh, you have uh, mechanisms for anchoring uh, transcription activators, whereas in contrast in heterochromatin you have the more condensed structure. I'll talk briefly about this key protein, heterochromatin protein 1, which is my very favorite protein, uh, but you have hypoacetylated uh, histone tails, and in particular, methylation of histone 3 on lysine 9 seems to be very characteristic of heterochromatin. Now, these <coughs> modifications provide a, a layer of information beyond what you see in the DNA. And that is, of course, what people nowadays uh, think of when they're talking about epigenetics. <coughs> and so, epigenetics can be defined uh, as uh, differences that are heritable through mitosis, but independent of DNA sequence. And in some cases, we think this information is also heritable through meiosis, although that's much harder uh, to discuss because our evidence isn't as good. Um, but uh, the term derives from developmental biology. People have been aware for some time uh, of the fact that uh, the uh, newly fertilized egg is a single cell, go from there to 248, these cells are totipotent. They can lead to any of a number of tissues. But once those decisions are made as to what type of cell you are going to be, they are heritable. So when a liver cell divides, you expect to get two liver cells, right? You remember you're a liver cell. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole industry now trying to reverse that memory in order to create um, uh, stem cells, renewable stem cells uh, for an individual for various therapeutic uh, region, reasons. But what they have to do is change the whole epigenetic pattern. Not a trivial thing. 
Okay, so uh, how do we maintain information in the genome independent of the DNA sequence? Uh, the commonest mechanisms are uh, modification of the DNA itself. Uh, methylation of the cytosines is most common. This is uh, used uh, extensively in mammals and in plants. It's not general uh, in the sense that, for example, neither flies uh, or worms use DNA methylation to any extent, uh, if at all. Um, but uh, in, in a number of systems, it's very important. Nuclear localization uh, is another kind of information. Uh, the heterochromatic masses, remember, tend to be associated with uh, the nuclear <coughs> periphery and maintaining that position and linkage to the uh, nuclear lamin uh, is very important uh, in silencing. Uh, but chromatin structure uh, is the um, kind of mechanism with the most potential in the sense that it has the most variation for you to work with in terms of devising information structures. I maintain, of course, that it's all about silencing. Uh, I'm into sculpture as opposed to, to painting, so it's what you take away that counts. Uh, and as uh, an example, let me mention that there's a whole series of mutations uh, in the human genome that are based on incorrect silencing. So uh, there are a number of cases where the mutation is the expansion of a triplet repeat. And remember, repeats are characteristic of heterochromatin. Uh, and when you get to a certain size repeat, that apparently triggers a recognition in the cell and you see establishment of local heterochromatin that shuts down that gene. Now there's actually nothing wrong with the gene itself in terms of its ability to produce a message that could be translated into the appropriate protein. It's been shut down by local heterochromatin formation. And needless to say, the potential for um, manipulating the epigenetic state is something that uh, drug companies are interested in. Okay, so looking at uh, the genome, a lot of us are interested in when, where, and how does DNA silencing occur? How does the cell know which things to silence and which things not to silence? It's very important. But we've decided, and I've decided to approach this by looking at this situation of the genes embedded in the chromatin and asking how do they evade silencing? How do they cope with that environment? So in thinking about heterochromatin formation, uh, and we've done this uh, in part by looking at this fourth chromosome and its evolution. We're interested in how the chromatin is organized and packaged to promote silencing and this question of the fourth chromosome genes. Do they have unusual characteristics? Do they have, you know, a, a promoter that's got extra oomph in it? Is there some difference in the way they're organized? Um, how do they manage to function in that milieu? Okay. So we use fruit flies uh, for this, um, partly because they're cute and they're wonderful. Uh, this stems from Thomas Hunt Morgan's uh, bringing flies into the lab in 1910 and, and feeding them by uh, the, sending out the text to just pick up the, the leftover and rotten bananas uh, down at the docks. Uh, fruit flies, uh, Drosophila melanogaster and its relatives are not an agricultural pest. They only lay their eggs on rotting fruit um, and not on uh, the fruit you want to send to market. We have to emphasize this point over and over uh, in order to send mutants around the world, which we like to do. Um, but the motto is, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. Okay. They have a number of characteristics that uh, were important from the beginning. <coughs> Short life cycle, easily maintained, cheap. Um, they lend themselves to biochemical approaches as well as genetic. Simple genome, since 1995, we've had a good reference sequence. Uh, and they are metazoans that are useful for behavioral, developmental, and human disease research. Um, I had a wonderful talk at the fly meeting this year called The Eye of the Fly on how personality traits evolve from stochastic stochastic processes in the brain. And if anyone's interested, ask me this evening after we've had a beer or something. <laughs> it was a great talk, okay? Uh, very interesting. But what attracted me to the flies were the polyton chromosomes and the position effect variegation assay. 
So flies undergo a complete metamorphosis, uh, and during the larval stage, the cells grow larger without dividing. So you go through 10 rounds of replication in the salivary gland with no mitosis, uh, and that produces these very large chromosomes easily seen in the light microscope from characteristic banding pattern, provided the first visual map for people of uh, genes along a genome, and showing that, that yes, indeed, all those linkage numbers really mean something. Um, that lends itself to determining the pattern of distribution, both in DNA sequences, and that was done by Mary Pardew, and we use these to develop that ability to see the distribution of different chromosomal proteins using immunofluorescence uh, tags. The other important assay is position effect variation, <clears throat> and this allows us to sample the chromatin environment. The, we use the white gene as the reporter. Um, the white gene is required to get a red eye. You have to remember that it was the people that named it were the geneticists. They didn't know they had it until they didn't have it and showed that was heritable. So it's the lack of the gene that gives you the white eye. Uh, so if this gene is present in new chromatin and being normally expressed, you get the full red eye. But if it's been uh, juxtaposed with heterochromatin, either by rearrangement or transposition, you get silencing <clears throat> of the gene in some of the cells in which it should normally be active. And it's a stochastic process, so you get this variegating phenotype. Okay? And that gives us an assay uh, for the chromatin structure. <coughs> okay. Any questions on that? Okay, I've convinced you all flies are wonderful, right? <laughs> all right, now the particular fourth chromosome. This is a, the karyotype of uh, Drosophila melanogaster. You have your sex chromosomes, two large autosomes, and then the small autosome, often called the dot chromosome for obvious reasons. Uh, and um, the regions that are considered constitutive heterochromatin, based on all the properties I gave you on that slide, uh, are indicated uh, by filling in in black. So paracentric regions, there are small regions with the telomeres, all the Y chromosome, all the dot chromosome. No meiotic recombination, geneticists hate it. Uh, <laughs> but it has uh, 80 functioning genes on it, okay? So it presents a little bit of a conundrum. High repeat density, about 30% repeats in melanogaster, the lack of recombination. When we use the polytene chromosomes and stained with an antibody to HP1, we see staining of the paracentric heterochromatin here, which is the coalescence of the heterochromatin for all five chromosome arms. And you see staining of the fourth chromosome, okay? So it's associated with these heterochromatin proteins, it's associated with the HTK9 modification, <coughs> That's critical for that. And if I insert reporter genes uh, into the fourth chromosome, most of the time they're silenced. There are a few domains that look to be permissive, but mostly they're silenced even when they're inserted within a fourth chromosome gene that normally functions. Okay? But at the same time, you'll notice that there is a banded structure here, and that's characteristic of the euchromatic arms, not of the paracentric heterochromatin, which is collapsed here. So that's a, a little bit in between. And with these 80 genes, it has a gene density that's quite similar to the gene density out here in the euchromatic arms. Okay. And those genes are active and important. A number of them are key transcription factors. ILIS is a fourth chromosome gene. You know about ILIS? This is I formation. Has to be expressed at a certain time, certain place, and it's a fourth chromosome gene, and it works. Okay, now position effect variegation. Let me remind you how this uh, was discovered and is working. Uh, is a good reporter for gene silencing, as I mentioned. It was first discovered by Mueller. Uh, he was using x-rays back when x-rays were new and the hot thing. Uh, and he discovered not only did he recover white-eyed flies, he recovered these variegating flies, which he called ever sporty uh, <coughs> because they have this uh, oddity of the uh, gene being expressed <coughs> normally in some cells and being silenced in others. About 10 years after that, it was shown that what was happening with the x-rays was a rearrangement. Oh, uh, Mueller showed that he could get revertence. Okay, so he knew there was nothing wrong with the gene. Uh, it was something about 
where it was in the nucleus. That's why it's called position effect. Sally, what did we call the nucleus? Ever sporting. Ever sporting. <laughs> Hopping around. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, when you looked at the polyteen chromosomes carefully, what you found was an inversion. So there's been a, a breakpoint within the paracentric heterochromatin on the X. It's on the X. There's been a breakpoint adjacent to the white gene, an inversion of that fragment. Now the gene is juxtaposed to a mass of heterochromatin, and you see spreading uh, across that. I put a little touch of yellow here to indicate that spreading. This is not originally heterochromatin. It's been impacted by its proximity to that heterochromatic mass. Okay. Um, but what this enables us to do, then, is a finer map of the genome. Now, this is before sequencing. What we did was develop a P element, a transposable element, that we can induce to transpose within the fly, uh, carrying two genes. One is a copy of the white gene driven by a heat shock promoter, <clears throat> and the other is uh, a second heat shock gene that we know a lot about and could uh, therefore use for comparative studies. Um, so this was an undergraduate project. Uh, that is, well, first the postdoc made the P element, put it into flies on the X chromosome, and then the undergraduate spent a summer mobilizing that P element uh, and screening the resulting flies. <clears throat> and they did 7,000 crosses and got 3,000 mobilizations, 3,000 times where it popped out of where it normally was and went in somewhere else. Of those 3,000, 2,970 looked like this, and 30 looked like this. So I know for a fact that a 1% level of reward will keep undergraduates working all summer. <laughs> And uh, what they found was that when we then mapped those variegating lines, indeed they inserted into the paracentric heterochromatin, telomeres, fourth chromosome, and the Y. And then um, we did the original mapping just by in situ hybridization, that sort of thing. But then in 95, the genome was sequenced. Uh, and we developed this map, which shows you the fourth chromosome. Here are the 80 genes. <laughs> Uh, and here are the transposable elements. Okay, so 30% transposable elements, 80 genes. All of the green genes are genes where I've got a reporter directly inserted in that gene. And you can see that the vast majority of times the reporter is variegating even though the gene does just fine. So there's something about these genes that's different. There are some permissive regions. It turns out what we discovered later on uh, is that those permissive regions uh, are domains that are packaged with polycomb. Those of you that are developmental biologists will recognize that as uh, a different <clears throat> type of chromatin packaging that, uh, again, regulates off-on states. And it seems to be permissive for DNA swan hypersensitive site formation. And again, I can show anyone who's interested more detail. OK, so now we wanted to know more about this chromosome in evolutionary terms. Is what we're seeing in the Lanagaster true up and down the line <coughs> in terms of this collection of genes and the environment? And what have been the impacts of living in heterochromatin in terms of the evolution of those genes? So to look at that, we engaged our undergraduates, which is all of your students, uh, in looking uh, originally at these four species. So Melanogaster is our reference species. It's very well annotated. It's, you've, you've been using it, right? So you know uh, that that's home base. We compared it to Erecta, Mohovensis, and Grimshai, thereby having two of the Sophophora and two of the Drosophila, uh, reaching over 40 million years of evolution. And all of these have uh, a small uh, fourth chromosome, which uh, forms this little banded teeny tiny chromosome that is positive when stained with antibodies for H3K9-dimethyl. So looking at the genes, what we found <clears throat> was that the coding spans are larger for the genes on the F element than on the D element. And I'm now remembering that I forgot to introduce that terminology. Um, as the flies evolve, they don't always maintain the same number of chromosomes. 
This is Melanogaster. I've got four chromosomes, <coughs> but I could have a species where the two arms of the second autosome are in fact independent chromosomes. Okay? And in fact, you can do the whole thing. So Mueller some time ago said, look, we've got to label the arms, and he called them by letters A, B, C, D, E, F. So the F element is the fourth chromosome. Okay? Uh, and these collections of genes tend to stay together. 90% of the genes that are on the B element in, in Melanogaster will be on the B element in Grimshaw. Not 100%, but 90%. And that actually is a kick in the sense that your student may be working on a gene that's supposed to be a fourth chromosome gene and sitting there and scratching their head and but it's coming up on another chromosome. What did I do wrong? And the answer is nothing. Uh, it evolved. Um, okay, so back to the fourth chromosome, F element genes. So bright colors of the F element pastels are our comparative region, which is on the D element. It's this little chunk right in here, uh, mega base, right at the base of the arm where uh, it's distinctly euchromatin, but in terms of the organization of the nucleus, it's got to be close to the chromosome. I'm just trying to control for that variable, because the fourth is inevitably close to the chromosome. That's all there is of it. Um, OK, larger coding spans, which primarily reflect the re uh, amount of repeat DNA in the introns. But it's also true that the coding regions, per se, are a bit larger. We tend to have large genes on the F element uh, because they have a larger number of coding exons. Exon size is pretty much the same. So, And we understand the growth in the intron size in terms of the amount of repetitious DNA that's been inserted in those introns. We don't actually understand why the number of coding exons is larger. And I think I showed you this the other night. One of the interesting things we found <clears throat> is that the F element genes uh, show very weak selective pressure uh, in terms of codon bias. Uh, so whereas if you look at the D element genes and you compare codon bias in terms of just looking at the number of different codons represented versus looking at the representation relative to the genes that are expressed at a high level, and you would assume there'd be some selection for this in terms of the number of tRNAs and so forth. You get the negative slope for the D chromosomes, but not for the F <coughs> elements with the exception of Grimshaw. And I think I said the other night, but you may have been asleep, uh, <laughs> uh, Grimshaw is uh, the Hawaiian fruit fly, so very far to verge, uh, cute insect with picture wings, because it couldn't blotch it on the wings, uh, but lays its eggs on wet, sloping sand and has been lost from the stock center, so we're not able to investigate it further. But I would suggest, on the basis of this observation, uh, that the level of heterochromatin is not the same, that it's weaker in some way. But of course, just from looking at this, I don't know whether that means there is some portion of the F element that's heterochromatin and some portion that's not, and so forth and so on. It'd be interesting to go back and look at the distribution of repeats, but we haven't done that. OK. Another strange but interesting thing is that the F elements show a lower melting temperature. Uh, so if you scan across the, the DNA, uh, you can see that, that the, the bright colors, the F elements, are showing a significantly lower melting temperature than uh, the uh, D elements. Again, the smallest difference is in Grimshaw, pastel purple to dark purple, whereas the largest differences are in Melanogaster and Erecta, orange to red. And uh, some of this has got to be uh, uh, related to AP richness, the more AP is the lower the melting temperature. Uh, but we've looked at that, and we can't explain it all that way. It has to there's something about the pattern of the nucleotides in the F element that's different. That might facilitate transcription in a heterochromatic environment, because, of course, you have to do strand separation to get transcription. 
What we do know is that they managed to do it, uh, but if you look at levels of gene expression in either S2 cells or BG3 cells, and you compare the euchromatic genes with the genes <coughs> that are in the paracentric heterochromatin, and there's 200 to 400 genes of this type, with the 80 genes in the fourth chromosome, the levels of expression are pretty comparable. Now, the number of outliers differs because this is 14,000 genes, this is 400, this is 80. Okay. Uh, but overall, um, you'll see in some of the old, older literature that genes in heterochromatin are expressed at a low level. That's not true. Reporter genes, euchromatic genes that are moved into heterochromatin, are silenced or expressed at a low level. But the genes that live in heterochromatin are doing just fine. <laughs> Okay. I have a friend who just wrote a, a review because he was really annoyed about this. Said, oh, <laughs> all the textbooks are wrong. <laughs> and he has a point that um, uh, a great deal of the heterochromatin is transcribed because what we see is very large genes. There are long transcripts. It's bizarre. Okay, chromatin. What are we seeing now when we look at the results of the chromatin immunoprecipitation assays. We did a big project called Bot and Code in which we did uh, 50 different chip experiments, chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments, to map the pattern of histone modifications and the pattern of these non-histone chromosomal proteins across the whole genome. <clears throat> and then we amalgamate that data. So this shows you for BG3 cells, which is a particular Drosophila cell line, that if we put together all of the active genes and we force them into a metagene, and then we look at the distribution of these proteins, <clears throat> what we see is that the silencing marks are depleted right at the transcription start site. Okay? Both your level of histone uh, HDK9 ditrimethyl and your HP1, take a dip right here. And that makes sense because you've got to create an opportunity for the polymerase to get in there. <coughs> and indeed, you see uh, that right here at the transcription start site, you have your peak of H2K4 uh, trimethyl, which is associated with transcription start sites, and you have your peak of RNA polymerase, right? And this is where transcription is getting started. So the implication is that as long as you are able to access the transcription start site, you can transcribe. The, the machinery is there to just plow right through this structure, even though it goes right back to being heterochromatic in terms of having high levels of HP1 and high levels of H3K9. In a certain sense, it's merely an exaggeration of what you see in the euchromatin. So you remember in euchromatin, <clears throat> your genes are all packaged up with nucleosomes. The transcription start sites become accessible as DNA1 hypersensitive sites. Uh, <clears throat> your polymerase can get in there and get started. But it has to transcribe through a nucleosome array. And at every step, it's displacing that nucleosome, transcribing, and the nucleosome reforms behind it right away. So I always tell the kids, I think about RNA polymerase as a two-car train. You got the engine with the cow catcher, uh, and <clears throat> that moves right along and um, remodels the nucleosomes as necessary, open up, transcribe, but the caboose closes everything right up. Okay? If you don't do that, you get spurious transcription starts all along that region that is supposed to be transcribed just from here. Okay, so you do that in euchromatin all the time. But in heterochromatin, you've got an extra layer of silencing, <clears throat> and our reporter genes seem to be defeated by this, fourth chromosome genes uh, seem to do just fine. Okay. Unfortunately, that story loses because the average undergraduate has no idea what a cow catcher is. <laughs> you, guys, you guys know about trains and cow catchers, right? But I've discovered that the current generation does not. I have to explain about buffalo on the prairie. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so... So how do they do it? So we're exploring that question in two ways. And one is uh, the comparative genomics. So here's where the current undergraduates come in. Uh, they're looking at a group of species 10 to 15 million years diverged from Melanogaster. 
which the evolutionary biologists tell us should be the sweet spot for motif finding. Okay? So when you're doing comparative genomics, <clears throat> it's like Goldilocks of the Three Bears. Uh, you can't be too close. If you compare humans with chimps, you can't tell what's important and what isn't important because it's all the same. But if you compare uh, humans with um, fruit flies, the most you can find are the conserved exons. Everything else has drifted too much. So 10 to 15 million years, which are different species of Drosophila, is supposed to be the right spot where we can not only annotate our genes, uh, picking up the exons <coughs> pretty nicely, but the regulatory motifs <coughs> should show enough conservation for us to find them. <coughs> That's the idea. And we've done some exploratory work with that, but it really waits until we get that next genome. And then we'll put them all together. We're using some software that Dr. Bueller's lab uh, developed <coughs> and that will enable us to compare those genes across species and look for conservation. Okay, and hopefully that's going to be happening this fall. In the meantime, we're also doing a, a wet lab approach. And what we've done here is to identify a mimic site, an insertion site, where we could put our HSP70 point reporter <clears throat> and we get a variegating fly, okay? But we can now put in a fourth chromosome gene. This is a site on the fourth chromosome gene. We'll put in the fourth chromosome gene and get full expression. <clears throat> now, our reporter is just this, HSB70 driven white that we've been using all along. We put it in here, it variegates. Uh, that silencing is lost with mutations in HP1. It's lost with a, a friend of HP1. Uh, the HVK9 methyltransferase and so forth. So we know that silencing is due to heterochromatin formation. Okay? <clears throat> now we put in instead uh, the regulatory region from RAD23. And we're going to put that upstream of the white gene. RAD23 is a gene on the fourth chromosome that is a very typical gene. It's what I would like to call a red-blue gene. The red signifies the chromatin state dominated by H3K4 trimethyl, so that's what you typically find at transcription start sites in euchromatic genes. You find it for these heterochromatic genes as well. But then over the body of the gene, you go right back to heterochromatin. Okay? RAD23 is uh, well expressed in a wide variety of tissues across development. It's actually thought to be part of the DNA repair machinery. It's upstream region. Taken, taken here includes not only it, but a transportable <coughs> element. Okay? And we took this whole fragment and put it upstream of white, and we got a completely red-eyed fly. Okay? So, gangbusters, it works. <laughs> what is it the RAD23 has that HSP70 doesn't have is the question. All right. So uh, we're now up to 18 constructs, swapping different parts. <laughs> And we can tell you that the presence of the 1360, that transposable element, is not particularly important. You can take it out, uh, or you can juxtapose it to the regulatory region, and you still have red-eyed flies. So I can chop this down to here, minus 100. This is fly 4, and it's red-eyed. If I chop it to minus 50, it's white-eyed. <laughs> Uh, if I keep it at minus 100, but take out a little bit here, it's white-eyed. Now, those white-eyed flies are not being silenced by heterochromatin. They just don't have their promoter. Okay? How do I know that? I can put in, uh, I can cross these flies to a mutation in HP1. And if they were um, suppressed by the heterochromatin, I should then see a, a positive response. I get nothing. And <laughs> we just knocked out the promoter. So we've had to spend a fair amount of time defining what the RAD23 promoter includes. And we think we have a pretty good idea at this point. Now, we've also done swap experiments where we've taken just a chunk of HSP70 and replaced it with the RAD23. Okay, and this one, uh, number eight, gives us low expression uh, that is not <laughs> responsive uh, to the heterochromatin, but number nine is. It gives a variegating phenotype, uh, and it's responsive to uh, mutations at HP1. 
doesn't achieve full expression nonetheless. Even though it goes to minus 100, and it has this bit, which we know is part of the promoter. Well, <clears throat> what's the secret? We think we've got an idea of what the secret is. And that came, again, from the bioinformatics. So uh, one of the students who was working on the reconciliation also stayed during the academic year. And Wilson put him to work using a, a program called MEMI, uh, which looks for common sequences. So he looked through all the 80 genes of Melanogaster and said, what's in common? And these are genes that are expressed in different kinds of places, and some are housekeeping and some aren't. Uh, what do they have in common? And he came up <coughs> with this motif. Uh, and then when he searched among known motifs, it matches pretty well with a binding site that is considered a binding site for topoisomerase 2. Okay, so remember, topo 2 is the enzyme that can break both strands of DNA, pass through and reseal. It's absolutely essential uh, for uh, mitosis and meiosis. Otherwise, the chromosomes get tangled up. It is also active in transcription, although TOP1 can do those functions as well. So what he found, though, was that the TOP2 site is present uh, at 50% of the fourth chromosome genes and 50% of the genes in paracentric heterochromatin and only 3% in our control D region. Okay, so it really does seem to perk up uh, on the fourth chromosome. Okay, so critical experiment. What happens if we take the TOPE 2 site and put it into HSP70 white? You can see a fly down there. Pretty good. Now, it's not full red. If you look at it under the microscope, you can see a little patch in this. But it's pretty good, and that's just the TOPE 2 site. Okay, now what happens when we take it out of RAD23? Uh, less expression? Uh, maybe a little modeling. We're doing this de deletion right now. We're not quite sure. It doesn't completely go away, but it certainly has an impact. So we think we're on the path to identifying some interesting things. And then the question is going to be, can we, what can we do in terms of looking at uh, conservation, uh, looking at the other species? This is derived only from the land <laughs> at this point. What was the second one that you were taking it out? Where? The first Here. one you have a mutation, and then the top two, and then the second and third you have um, the constant. Yeah. yeah, this mutates uh, top two in round 23. Right. If we don't mutate this, this is full red. We do mutate it, uh, it's a bit lower. Mm -hmm. But it's not, eh, it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this one also has a fragment of. Um, HSP70 in it, as does this. There's some suggestion that some of the fragments from HSP70 uh, promote variegation, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure about that. And since this one <coughs> was not <coughs> as, didn't have as big impact as we hoped it would, uh, we did a deletion, and that's in progress. Um, now, the big caveat to all this is I don't know for sure that this site is really a TOP2 site. It's identified that way in the literature, but when you look in the evidence, they had, well, there were four cases where it matched, uh, and then uh, came out of a CLEX experiment. So there's evidence, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, ironclad. It's not. Um, so it is an AQ-rich site, and it seems to have a real impact here. This is kind of the gangbusters result for the Ben's thesis, is putting that back in. Um, but whether it's really top two or not, I don't know. Okay, this is the only thing. Can you check top two into that? Well, we got some antibodies okay. from another lab, and we're testing to see how specific those antibodies are. But yeah, that would be a good experiment. Chip, see if, if uh, you can tell the difference uh, mm -hmm. in terms of these different constructs. Uh, another um, experiment uh, is to look it was Chip. What was the other thing? There was another one we were going to do. Oh, mutants. Mm -hmm. We've got some um, uh, mutations from Pan Geyer's lab in TOP2. And see if they have an impact. OK. <coughs> so, uh, heterochromatin sums this up. Heterochromatin formation, blah, blah, blah. 
Next steps. Okay, these are the species that we are using for these different experiments. The experiment that's winding up right now, motif hunting, uses this cluster. And then the experiment for the next few years on F expansion will use this cluster. Um, and the purple ones are ones we've already used. Okay. I did include uh, a slide here on things to look for when annotating fourth chromosome genes. Um, and this is kind of a cheat sheet that, that I give to my students. Uh, they pay more or less attention to. But your first clue, you know, the first thing you've got to establish is what is the homologous gene? Do you have uh, an orthologue in the species in question? Usually you do. We found only a few cases, uh, a few genes in uh, a few species where that gene's been lost. It happens. Uh, sometimes it's been moved to another chromosome. That happens. Um, so is it on the fourth chromosome? If it is, you've confirmed uh, one of your hypotheses. If it isn't, you investigate further. Are all the isoforms found in Melanogaster present? This will come up in your gene record finder. Uh, so you've got a basis to start from. How many exons? Is the indron exon pattern the same? Can you create that gene model? Uh, the splice sites, uh, usual, <coughs> unusual? And then, of course, the greater challenge is can you estimate the transcription start site? I think you could start that this afternoon. Um, we have had students look for regulatory motifs. I've just about gotten to the point of thinking that that should not be done. It's time consuming and it doesn't show up very much most of the time. Uh, we could run it just as easily when we've got the assembled data. So I'm tending to back off from that. <clears throat> we do ask the kids to look at the uh, syntony, the organization of the region. Uh, let's see how that's evolved. Okay, and then if you can do this in several different ways, depending on whether in your course you want a biochemistry slant. <clears throat> there are plenty of programs for looking at, at uh, protein structure and uh, conserved motifs in that uh, sense. Or development, you can go to Flybase, see how this thing was expressed in Flybase, um, so forth and so on. Different people have done different things depending upon the, the course that they're integrating into and the, the principles they want to put forward. All right, Catherine, your slides. So, um, yeah. Have you looked at any other promoters on the fourth chromosome, for example, ones that don't have the two site to see whether they can prevent silencing of the white gene? No. Um, I've, I've kept needling Ben to go back and say, OK, you've got 50-50. What is it that the genes that have the TOPE2 site have in common compared to the pool of fourth chromosome genes, the fourth chromosome genes as a whole? And he looked at all kinds of things, like size, and, and um, he tried to look at, at uh, levels of expression, though that's harder to compare. Um, and we haven't found anything. Now, have we redone this series of experiments using something besides RAD23? That would be a good thing to do. <laughs> if anyone would like the starting fly lines, we are happy <coughs> to provide them. And I am quite serious about this. I've got one session among the working groups. We're going to talk about some of the unique fly lines that we have. They are available now through June 10th. And I've got to close the lab by June 30th. So they are going away. Um, some of them we will send to the uh, Drosophila Bloomington Stock Center. Um, but they, they will take a maximum of 50. I've got a lot of fly lines. <laughs> This, this is one of the, you know, I hate to say bad things about Drosophila, but this is one of the bad things about Drosophila. There are no seeds. There's no way to store it. Uh, if you want that line, you've got to keep it. So. Have you looked at TOPE 1? Okay, TOPE 1. TOPE 1 tracks with RNA polymerase. It's always there. Always with RNA polymerase. Straight across the region transcribed. So you're making closing enzyme, you cannot transcribe very well without it. And it's just so are there binding sites for all, for to one on every single I don't think so. And I think it just interacts with the polymerase. Yeah. But don't <laughs> me on that one. But you can say the same thing about TOP2. TOP2 is a very abundant nuclear protein. And that's why this identification of these sites between TOP2 binding sites is kind of, yeah. 
you know you have TOP2 every time you have to resolve that topological string. So it's not very sequence specific. And so I'm not at all, I'm excited about the idea it might be a TOP2 site, because if that's true, then that argues that topology has something to do with the heterochromatin packaging and the fact that we're maintaining this di dichotomy, you know, the, the two-state situation that we have. That would be really cool. But I'm deeply suspicious that it's not TOP2, it's something else. So that 18 site is critical, but what's it binding? I don't know. Maybe TOP2, maybe not. <laughs> I want to talk to you about some fly lines, so. <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, so I, you, I know you look really nervous right now, but I want just about five or ten minutes before you have your time to go back downstairs and work on annotation to introduce the other two projects that are going to happen. Um, obviously, Sally's project is a very mature project. These projects are starting out, and so I just want to introduce you to the questions and the faces behind them. Some things for you to keep in mind as you transition into the GEP. All the training materials that we've done have been focused on um, the previous project, the project that's been described, and, and all, that's all the training materials that exist. So when you think about the curriculum that's available to you at just this moment, um, the, the most tried and tested curriculum are related to the project that you've just heard about. Curriculum for the other project is actively being developed. There is some that already exists, and there are people, I'll give you a summary at the end of numbers, who have already started to, to work on the Parasitoid Wasp project and also on the Pathways projects. Those are the, the um, slang or short, short terms, abbreviations that we use for those two projects, the Wasp project and the Pathways project. Um, those curricula will be developed and the thing I want to tell you, even for people who have to leave tomorrow, so people who are staying tomorrow, or staying for Sunday morning, you can hear Nate and Laura talk about this in much more detail. People who are leaving, you have an opportunity tonight at dinner to talk to faculty who have worked on these projects. Um, so just ask questions. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head who's done it, but I know some of them will be here tonight. So find those people at dinner if you're interested in seeing how these projects have been implemented um, with students. But I just want to introduce Nate to you. So Nate, the focus of, um, and he wanted me to take this slide out, but we just kept it in for his picture. Um, the focus of his project is um, the evolution of parasitoid wasp metabolism. And the initial sort of pilot study that he did was exploring um, the uh, lipid synthesis genes. So in parasitoid wasps, these organisms have lost their lipid synthesis gene. And I'll, I'll show you a great um, movie of them interacting with Drosophila. Um, what he is working on right now is actually an investigation of venom protein genes. So kind of going forward, the next big thing he's thinking about and gearing up for this coming academic year is going to be annotating um, venom protein genes. So let me kind of just orient you to that a little bit. So we all know about parasites, so organisms that exploit the resources of a host organism for their survival <coughs> and or development. Um, makes me miss my toddler for a second there. Uh, resources include nutrition, parental care, shelter. Um, parasit parasites have evolved new traits for their lifestyle, right? Sally alluded to that. There's been this back and forth interaction. Um, we know that from a behavioral perspective. And the really fascinating thing is, of course, that has an underlying genetic perspective. So we can look at the genome and, and try to figure out how that works. Parasitoids are a type of parasite that obligately kill their host. So this is where things start to get dark for Drosophila melanogaster. Um, parasitoid wasps that Nate study are obligate parasites of other insects, and they've been used traditionally to um, study host parasite interactions. Um, parasitoid wasps, specifically of Drosophila, so their mode of action is they infect fly larvae uh, using a modified stinger known as an ovipositor, and you can see that over there. Um, and they transfer venom proteins to the host during infection, and those venoms manipulate the metabolism of the host. So they manipulate specifically host signaling to suppress host immunity and alter host metabolism. So let's see it. This is really, really memorable. Um, so these are, this is one of Nate's wasps. You can see our friends, Drosophila melanogaster, as larva there. Um, and this one here is gonna get stung, and all of a sudden we see a lot less movement than 
um, in the other adjacent larvae. So usually I'm just pulling I imaginal disks out of these and staining them, but um, this is much more important in terms of uh, the wasp lifestyle to really kind of take advantage of, um, of dropping its eggs into the larva and then hijacking that metabolism. So what is Nate's ongoing research? He's interested in understanding the evolution in this upcoming project, the evolution and function of venom proteins in parasitoid wasps, um, specifically the evolution of venom encoding genes. So think about how this is a different kind of project now. Everything that we've talked about up until this point, studying silencing and organization of the genome and particular features of the fourth chromosome has really been looking at regions of the genome. Now, with both of these projects, we're switching to focusing on, in this case, a particular um, uh, physiological response, and so we're focusing on genes. So it'll be, a, you, can th you can imagine, it's going to be a little bit different. We're not just going to be looking at regions of the genome um, and finding what's there, but we're going to be focusing on um, finding different genes and trying to annotate the same genes across multiple species of these parasitoid wasps. So similarities and differences in terms of how the, the projects are going to be organized, that'll change the curriculum a little bit, and that's something that we're all going to work on. Um, so Nate's going to look for genome duplications and de novo genes. And um, one of the other things that he's interested in incorporating is a functional analysis of venom proteins. So um, thinking about um, whether these are acting as dominant negative proteins um, or protein mimics. What Nate has, so he's been a beneficiary of this um, partnership that's been formed. So he's used Galaxy G on ramp to build genome browsers for each sequence. Um, and he's, uh, sorry, this is overlapping here, sequenced the genomes for three parasitoid species. Um, his RNA-seq data and mass spec data from the purified venom, right? So now we have sequence and we're looking at what is there in that sequence. Um, what, have, what do we know so far about wasp venom uh, protein evolution? So initial blast results are suggesting that venom contains a high percentage of de novo genes. Um, and the de novo genes tend to be smaller than conserved genes. So um, we've, got, um, we've got the uh, molecular weight of conserved venom and novel venom there. Um, and you can see these are all, the blasts are coming up in uh, primarily in hymenoptera. <coughs> So what, do we, what is Nate in the process of learning about these venom proteins? Um, venom contains protein mimics. So these are proteins that resemble the host proteins. So remember again, Drosophila melanogaster is our host in this case of the parasitoid wasp. Um, and those proteins, that, those um, parasitoid wasp proteins that look like Drosophila proteins are interfering with uh, host protein function. So several venom proteins that he's been studying appear to mimic immune receptors. And so the prediction is that they will block immune signaling, and that's something that's going to be studied further. Any questions about that project? And how many genes are, are we looking for in each species? Mm. Yeah, you have a list of genes that we want to look for, right? It's a list of genes. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I'll ask Nate about that. And he'll be here in a little bit, so we can ask him. Um, the second project is Laura Reed's project. So Laura Reed is taking over as our director. She's at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And what she has been interested in is the evolution of the insulin signaling pathway in Drosophila. Um, that's a picture of Laura. And so her project we refer to as the Pathways Project. Um, to give you a little bit of the theoretical context for it, so. There are a lot of different network architectures that can produce the same outcome, I think, with respect to, to phenotype and, and fitness. And so one of the questions that she has is how does the network structure, right, if we think about the different structures here in the same phenotype, how does the network structure determine the robustness of function in response to perturbation, right, if we're, we're within species time scales. So obviously if you've got the same phenotype but you have a different underlying architecture, um, this architecture here, if we think about the underlying architecture, is going to be easily perturbed but highly evolvable, whereas an architecture that is more robust is going to be robust but then more resistant to evolution. 
Um, so she's really asking, how does the network structure influence and reflect the process of evolution in between species time scale? If we think about networks, um, most biological networks have this kind of hub and spoke architecture across the domains of life where the rate of protein evolution is going to correlate with the number of interactions uh, with other proteins, right? So if you've got a hub with a lot of interactions, that rate of evolution is going to be slower. And if you have these spokes, right, fewer interactions, you're going to see a, a faster rate of evolution. Um, and so, and you can see that here with the protein evolution rate and the number of physical interactions. As those interactions go up, our, our evolution rate is going to go down. There's more dependency there in terms of the overall system. Um, so to kind of remind you about the insulin signaling pathway, this is really well conserved across Metazoa. We can see um, the orthologs in C. elegans and Drosophila and in mammals. And so what Laura's really doing is focusing on genes in the insulin signaling pathway. Um, and we know a little bit about the evolution of the coding sequences. So the rate of protein evolution is greatest at the top of the pathway. So if we think about the insulin signaling pathway, right, and we have, um, when, we at, when we have the genes kind of more upstream, right, the rate of evolution is faster there than proteins that are further down in the pathway, correlating again with the number of interactions. Um, there have been many gene duplications and gene losses, as we know, within Drosophila. So this system really sets Laura up to ask this broader question of how does a network architecture um, affect the evolution of regulatory regions? We have information about coding regions. Now when we look at um, regulatory regions specifically, <laughs> um, also including transcription start sites, if we annotate genes in this well-studied study pathways, and specifically within insulin signaling as kind of our first example, um, what can we learn from that about the rate of evolution of these regulatory sequences? So we're characterizing the regulatory region evolution relative to the pathway of a particular gene, um, sorry, the position of a, of a particular gene within a pathway. And considering um, the role of gene duplication and other molecular evolutionary forces in um, how these genes have developed. So what we have are questions that can only be answered with a lot of annotation, right? And that's where your students are gonna come in. But now, not looking from the perspective of a chunk of the genome, but looking from the perspective of the insulin signaling pathway, can we go out and find the orthologs of those genes in the Drosophila species, or now up to 30 species that we have sequenced, and make comparisons between those so that we can look at different parts of the insulin signaling pathway to start and see um, how those genes have evolved. Questions about that? of it. So very last thing where we are now is um, we've kind of talked about the benefits of the DEP <laughs> and how many faculty we have involved. Just to give you a snapshot of what has happened most recently, 57 schools in the 18-19 um, academic year claimed F element projects, 11 schools claimed WASP projects, um, and, and just to give you a little bit broader history, so 237 WASP projects have been claimed by 17 schools over the past two years, the data that have been submitted back to Nate covers 100 genes. Um, so somewhere, there are 11 people who are doing this with their students. Some of them will be at dinner. You want to you find those people if thinking about the annotation of the WASP uh, venom genes is interesting to you. Seven schools have claimed pathways projects in the last academic year, um, and they have covered 97 genes and 102 projects. So pretty prolific for these first pilot years of these projects. So somewhere in the GEP there are seven people who have started to do the insulin pathway gene annotation. And um, some of those people will be at dinner tonight, along with Laura and Nate, who will both be here tonight. Um, so yeah, they can answer questions better than I can, but I'm happy to try if there's anything outstanding. So because the uh, insulin pathway project mm -hmm. that is based on the then all of the materials that are developed can be used for the project, right? Or no? So all of the, um, yeah, so all the annotation that we're going to be doing is going to use melanogaster as a reference and be annotated from other species. Yeah. The, uh, in terms of what a project looks like, so you won't necessarily be annotating 
all of the features in a region of the genome, it's going to be dealt with in a different way because you're going to be um, looking for the annotation of particular genes. Right. So seeming activity plus project. Exactly. Which is like specific to the Exactly. So specific to the insulin signaling pathway mm -hmm. versus specific to venom protein genes. Mm -hmm. But right with Nate's project, we're moving beyond Drosophila, outside of Drosophila. And so that's going to bring its own unique challenges to how the annotation works. Because the, the very introductory material is the same. It's yeah. neutrons and exons, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We're still in eukaryotes, so. Yeah. It uses the same splicing signals, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So your very basics are the same. But your scientific rationale is different. And we like to, to develop that with students. And ways you might extrapolate the project might be a little bit different, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did not intend at all to be discouraging and saying that these are going to be more complicated, but just keep an open mind. We're going to be doing some slightly different things, but the core of what we're doing, the annotation, is still really the fundamental ideas. And so, you know, these, these have already been piloted and they are working well with students. So if those are the scientific projects that are interesting, interesting you, I definitely encourage you to talk to those people. And as Sally said, you can work across all projects um, in different contexts in your institution. I should know better, but do, do those get reconciled as well? The was and the pathways? Um, I used to be part of the protocol. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, with the new grant, we're also moving towards <coughs> the idea that there will be reconciliation projects going on uh, at different schools during the summer. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've been hoping to do, but we haven't really um, been able to organize and support it to now, is to make the reconciliation um, an open opportunity so that other GDP students could apply rather than just those at that school. Now, John Braverman is going to start uh, the um, taking over the F element expansion project. He's in the Philadelphia area. And I think he said that the first summer he wants to work primarily with uh, his own students, but then he wants to open it up uh, particularly starting with the Philadelphia area for the whole schools. And in the long run, you would really like to see that as a, a kind of open competition opportunity uh, for any GEP student to apply to. Uh, it's funding, so we've got to keep working at it. Is there a chance they can have those uh, with our EU students in the summer? Yeah, well, one of the working groups um, will be me and John and a couple of other folks who would practice on REU grants and writing an REU for the, the F element extension specifically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there are a couple of funny vehicles out there. Uh, the, the goal would be to eventually have a kind of a smorgasbord of different projects and different um, summer opportunities. But we've got to grow to, to do that. We have to be a little bit careful because the power of massively parallel undergraduates um, is there, but if, if we dice it up too much, they're not massively parallel anymore. They're not parallel, but they're not going to be massive. Um, and then it takes longer to finish any given project. Uh, that's the only disadvantage. Um, but that is a disadvantage, science from what it is. Yeah. Those are slow enough already. Um, and then, so it's, it's always a delicate balance in terms of making sure we're doing things that are interesting, but making sure that we're doing things that we're not going to get run over by somebody with 20 postdocs. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's an awful lot that can be done, and an awful lot of raw data, and more and more raw data accumulating all the time in terms of sequencing. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, Taking a careful look at some of these species is, as you can tell your students, nobody's ever looked before. It's up to you. Uh, <coughs> that's going to continue to be true. Biology is wonderful that way. <laughs> infinitely expandable. Maybe not infinitely. <laughs> we are going to run out of species here. <laughs> Actually, part of the question right now is to sequence a lot of species before they were endangered. So we know where we were, if not where we are. Mm -hmm. That's no sense.